Welcome back to Improv is No Joke, where it's all about becoming a more effective communicator by embracing the principles of improvisation. I'm Peter Margaritas, and today we're talking with Aaron Daver, CPA, who's the founder and CEO of Aaron Daver Coaching and Consulting, a firm specializing in providing coaching, training, and leadership development to the accounting industry. Aaron, welcome to my podcast, and thank you for taking time out of your very busy day to have a conversation with me today. Well, thank you so much for having me, Peter. Uh, as we're recording this, or also record video recording it, and as you will see when you're watching this on YouTube, the sun is shining where Aaron is, and <laughs> today is April 6th when we're recording this, so some uh, a month or two or three will go by before it actually is aired, but it, she is talking to us from beautiful San Diego, California. However, she used to live in Northeast Ohio in the Cleveland area, and I think she was saying before we got started how much she missed the winters, the cold, the snow, and, and think about maybe relocating back. Is that, or is that just sarcasm on my part? Oh, you know, I do miss my Cleveland Cavaliers, but I could do without the weather. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I actually, I was thinking about this. Um, I played golf in San Diego at an AICPA conference some years ago, and the conference was in May. I'm in Southern California in May, and it was the coldest round of golf I think I ever played. The, what was it? The May gray mm -hmm. and the June gloom? Yeah, that's right. Our nicest months don't really come around until September and October. And then through now, through right. April? <laughs> I thought it was sunny and beautiful year round in San Diego. So I guess I was, I, I learned the hard way I was completely wrong about that. You must have been here on one of our 20 days of gray. Oh, uh, I was, it felt a lot like maybe fall in Cleveland at times when we were playing <laughs> golf. <laughs> so, Aaron, um, Give us your story. Tell us tell us about yourself because I, uh, you are a CPA, and, and as I mentioned in the intro, but you're not your stereotypical CPA, which kind of really intrigues me because obviously I, I'm I'm not one either. <laughs> yeah, I like to tell people I'm a recovering accountant. <laughs> um, <laughs> and for those of you who are just wrapping up busy season, I know you know what that means <laughs> or what that feels like. Um, but I did. I started my career in public accounting. I actually really enjoyed the work uh, for a short amount of time. And then the long hours just really started to get to me and eventually moved on to industry looking for work-life balance, which is also kind of a joke because we all know that it doesn't happen if you're in the accounting field, regardless of where you're working. Um, but while I was in industry, I had an opportunity to really work with leaders of all different shapes and sizes. That's one of, I think, the gifts of working in accounting is you do get a chance to connect and work for different people, which keeps it exciting, right? It's not a sterile environment. But um, what I learned was there were a few that I just absolutely loved working for. And there were also a few that <laughs> weren't that fun to work for, right? Didn't really have the leadership skills that were required. And at the time, it just felt like, gosh, this is not for me. I don't want to work with people like this. And so I made the jump. I went completely 180 from accounting and started a coaching practice. And really, the thing that I love about the work I'm doing now is that I get to come back to the accounting industry and work with these professionals to help them be their best selves, help them to become better leaders who are more effective and who can connect with the people that they're leading. So, so tell me when you, when you left public accounting, so you, you, you uh, uh, and uh, just left accounting and went into coaching. Tell me about that, this coaching venture that, that you went down. Well, really what happened, it's kind of a, an interesting story, but I went to a cocktail party in our neighborhood. Uh, we live in a condo complex. There's quite a few units here. And actually wasn't even thinking I was going to go, but I got dragged there <laughs> against my will. Um, and I ended up meeting a neighbor of mine. And she overheard me telling somebody that I was an accountant and I was really not enjoying my work. And I felt like there was more to life. And she came over and said, 
you know, I've been there. I've, I'm a recovering accountant too. And you should come check out this program. And it was a coach training program. And really, I went hoping to learn more about myself because I was in this place where I knew I didn't like what I was doing, but I also didn't know what else was out there. So people said, well, why don't you go back to school? Or why don't you switch careers? But I really felt stuck. I didn't feel like I had a clear direction. So I actually took on coaching and coach training as a way to just learn more about myself, really for the personal Mm -hmm. development aspect of it. And almost by accident, fell into it as a career. Well, that's a great story. So you kick it and scream and go into a cocktail party. I don't know what anything <laughs> that's like. I think I run to them versus kick and scream. <laughs> but it's, you know, even to that point, um, and I, when I talk to accounts and stuff about networking, there's, you, just, you, you just never know what could happen at any type of networking event. And the ones that you tend to go to kicking and screaming or hemming and hawing or hey, you know, drag. Actually, I find that turned out that something actually magical happens from that. That's happened to me a couple of times. Oh, yeah. It's all about relationships. It's, you just never know. It's all about relationships because we, we are all in the people business and the more relationships, the better relationships. So when you were prior to coming back into the accounting side of, of this, what type of clients, what type of uh, were you coaching? What type of industries were you were you involved with? I worked with people from a variety of industries. Um, Some of them I still work with today, even though my focus is on the accounting industry. Uh, I was working with psychologists. I was working with um, attorneys. I was working with small business owners, people who were leading teams. Um, And a lot of that is consistent still with my business now, working with business owners or team leaders. But... Really, when I was starting out, I would work with anybody. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, One of the uh, qualifying questions were, does the check clear? Will the check clear? (laughs) I'd be happy to work with you. That'd be great. (laughs) (laughs) That that true entrepreneurial spirit, when somebody asks you, can you do this? And you pause for a moment, you go, of course I can. Give them, you pause and you look at your bank account and you're like, yeah, yeah I can. <laughs> I can. Give them, a great, give them a great big smile and then go into the lab and get it done. So yeah. when, when you were going through this development, uh, through this training program, what, what did you find that was maybe a strength of yours that you have that maybe you didn't realize was as strong uh, as you thought it was? You know, one of the things that I I really think I took away from it was connecting, connecting with people. And it's something that I love to do. And I think in that regard, I took it for granted that it's a skill that not everybody has. Uh, But it's something that I really enjoy. I really need interaction with people. I love to meet new people and learn different things from them and from their experience. And so then they told me that by connecting with people and helping them to develop as individuals, I could build a business. I thought, well, that's pretty awesome. <laughs> that's like a good deal. Um, and I think I took that for granted in the in the accounting industry too. Not not everyone has that natural ability to connect and relate to other people. So it's a skill that I like to help others develop. Um. I got a couple follow-up questions, but one, I mean, we go back, how long have we known each other on LinkedIn? Uh, <laughs> I don't know, maybe a year or two. Yeah, I, I was trying to find that information, but I we had talked um, earlier this year, maybe last month, and I believe a, a friend of, mutual friend of ours kind of gave us an introduction. Um, mm-hmm. So Cody, edit this piece out because I just went blank on her name. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, a, a mutual friend of ours, Kristen Rampey, who is a uh, I interviewed uh, a, a while ago, kind of gave us one of those online virtual introductions on LinkedIn, and mm-hmm. you had contacted me uh, a month or two ago. And we were kind of emailing back and forth. And we said, "Why don't we just pick up the the, the phone and have a conversation?" Mm-hmm. And, and all of a sudden, in like an hour flew by. I think. Because I, I mean, we, we we do share a lot of the same interest in the accounting profession, um, mm. but it's just making that connection. And you're right; uh, a, a lot of our brethren in the accounting profession really have a hard time making that connection. I hear a lot of times 
what do I say? Mm-hmm. It's easy as just walking. I'm just saying hello and, and just asking some questions. But but I know there's there's a, a bit of nerves involved. But the, the one thing I, I do want to ask about your background: Did you when you uh, graduated college? Did you go immediately into the accounting profession? Yeah, that's kind of an interesting story too. I <laughs> I went into business school, and my parents said, you know, what do you what do you want to do? What do you want to major in? We're not going to pay for your college for you to just go party the whole time, right? You have to have some direction. And I said, you know, I'm not really ready to answer that question right now. But all I know is I will not major in accounting. (laughs) I know for sure. And I started to register for classes. And wouldn't you know it because I was I had transferred. So I it was kind of late to the game. And the only class available for intro to accounting was with this professor who had a real reputation. He was the guy that was going to chew you up and spit you out and like filter people out of his beloved accounting program. Ah. So I thought, oh, I'm in for it. And one day he told me, he came up and he said, Aaron, I think you're really good at this. You should consider a career in accounting. And that's literally all it took. Next thing you know, (laughs) graduating with my degree in accounting. And um, I did. I was able to uh, secure a full-time offer through an internship and moved out to California and started right away. So do you remember the name of the professor? Yeah, it was Dr. Robert Bloom at John Carroll University, I'm sure. Um, Everyone knows him. People still talk about him. I hear he's still there. (laughs) (laughs) So if anybody's listening to this podcast in the Cleveland area and went to John Carroll University, please go tell the professor that to listen to this podcast. I I think he would enjoy that that reference because being a former uh, professor of accounting at Ohio Dominican University, I love it when I would hear stories like that from my students. Um, that that that's re- that's really cool. But you you've had to, I mean you you're not your stereotypical cat. You, you, it must have been growing up, and, and your parents gave you this gift of communicating this this gift of 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 gab. In my family, I'm you know I was raised in a Greek American household mm. that. All, uh, you see, all we do is we 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 talk, we connect, we 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 serve food. I worked in restaurants for growing, and that's where I developed that that skill. And I'm curious how how yours was developed at an early age. Um, you know, I think my mom's very social. She always used to throw parties, host events at our house. Um, we were always kind of the house to be at. Um, but my Dad's a little bit more shy, so I'm not sure. I must have gotten it from my mom, and maybe a little bit of having to figure it out on my own uh, in school. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, that, that's great because it does take a little bit of. Uh, I think once you get the hang of it, or once you're comfortable with it, um, mm-hmm. you don't think about it. But it, it's making that transition from um, it's something I'm not used to to something I I, I need to do and. Uh, last year, I was in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and my contact there was a partner in a local firm. And I, I asked her the question, how did you get into accounting? And, yeah. and her words were, because I didn't like people. Mm. All I wanted to do was come to the firm, sit in my cubicle, and do tax work. Mm. And I said, now, wait a minute. Clearly, you're a partner in the firm. You realize at some point in time that you needed to make better connections. And she goes, "Yes." And and and, and I've worked on it very hard to get to it. it doesn't she goes? It still, it doesn't overly come natural. But she's worked so hard in perfecting it that she doesn't have to think twice about it. Except, she said she could stand in front of 400 people, teach a class, not even worry. But mm. some sometimes she struggles and. um smaller social say four or five people and, and a circle communicating and she just goes blank or, or tries to stay away. What what advice would you give this person and, and how to break through that? Well, I think that you said something interesting where like we have to do it. And I think it also gets easier the more you do it. So part of it's just about practice where you start to trust yourself in those types of situations. And it's interesting because usually it's backwards, right? Where you could talk to five people, but (laughs) put me in front of 400 and no thanks. Right. You know, Um, but on the other hand, you can rehearse what you're going to say to 400 people 
and you don't have to you don't have to deal with that uncertainty of what will they say or what will they ask me or how will they respond. So I would say practice for mm-hmm. sure. And I think it's really just about trusting yourself and owning who you are, all your quirks and all of it. Just bring it and connect with people. I, I like that all all of our quirks because we all do and a lot of us are are will will let that be a hindrance into doing something because they're afraid they're going to make a mistake or say something stupid. If I had a nickel or a dime for every time I say something stupid in a, in a networking event, I could retire very rich. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's you know when it was you learn when you say something stupid and you go, oh, you know I'm sorry I didn't really mean or apologize or just move on or or move past it and don't make it that big of a deal while inside your head your inner critic is just screaming their bloody brain, uh, voice <laughs> at you it's like it, it it is that balance and and that confidence level yeah and i think it's also remembering that they're human too that they've been in your shoes they've made the silly comment at a networking event before, you know, we can all really relate. I think we hold ourselves to this super high, sometimes unmeetable standard um, and think that everybody else is perfect. And we're the only ones that, you know, put our foot in our mouth sometimes. And (laughs) it's just not, it's not fun to live from, you know, it's so much pressure. Except failure, except that you're going to screw up and make a mistake. And the other thing I tell audiences on this on this topic is um, you know why you might not like the network you know why you might be hesitant to network and and it's it all goes back to your mother I, I blame your mother I blame my mother I blame all mothers for those who struggle in networking because your mother always told you don't talk to strangers strangers however, a stranger is somebody who's in downtown Cleveland uh, with a bottle of Mogan David trying to uh, get a conversation going with a mailbox or a light pole. That's uh-huh. a stranger. But I, I, I always tell people, in any business environment, these aren't strangers. These are opportunities. And the more that you can grasp that knowledge that you just never know what could come about in meeting someone and not giving them that power of thinking that, you know, that, that stranger power um, it, it's easier to get past that shyness. It's easier to get past it and, and, and embrace it versus repel from it. Yeah. And, you know, my, my husband is actually has historically been very introverted, very much against networking. If he could build his business, you know, be successful in his career without it, he was the kind of guy who would do anything yeah. to avoid that step. And, we actually met with somebody recently who's very successful in the military um, arena. He's an admiral. And he was sharing that about sometimes in his career where he just, you know, kind of went above and beyond to help somebody who was struggling. And then later on was faced with, um, I think he shared that it was someone he had mentored when he was working at the Naval Academy. And then he was up for a job promotion. And turns out that student's dad was going to be his future boss. And it's just things like that where you he didn't know that at the time when he reached out to mentor this, you know, young navy officer. Yeah. And it turned out that it was somebody that really ad- advanced his career later on. So, I always think of that too because the the thing I see at networking sometimes is people say, "Well, I'm not selling anything or I don't need to network for my accounting career." And You might not, quote unquote, need it right now, but you just, like we said, you just never know where you may be able to help that person or they may be able to help advance your career at some point. Yeah, uh, I agree with that. You just never know. I Somebody came up to me at a conference and said that uh, their companies had just merged and he'd been the CFO for for one company for 20 plus years and now he's going to be out of a job. And he goes, oh, my God, I haven't networked in 20 some odd years. And he had this fear in his face. And I said, one, breathe. Two, go home and take a a, a pad of paper and just start writing names down. You have been networking. You just haven't been really focused on it. But ultimately, you've run, you've made connections, you've run into people. You you just need to remember who they are, write them down. And I think you'll be surprised how big your network is. And, and then I put the caveat: it could have been, it could have been a whole lot bigger if you 
said, I need to network at any business opportunity, any CPE event, and, and just get to know as many people as possible. Yeah, absolutely. Because you just never know. <laughs> um, so when, when you're coaching those in the accounting profession, uh, are you coaching at the, are you primarily coaching at the manager level, senior manager, partner, CFO, what, staff? What What is the, mm-hmm. the crux? Yeah, I like to say that I coach throughout the career life cycle. Um, I start with as early as CPA candidacy. So that might be fresh out of college, um, just starting their careers or sometimes up to the manager level. I help candidates who are struggling to pass the CPA exam to be more successful. And it's been, um, they've been having really good results from it, which is pretty cool. Uh, Okay, we're gonna stop the phone right now. Hold on a second. Tell me about this. You're helping coach those who are sitting for the CPA exam, but it sounds like you're not coaching them the technical aspect of taking the exam. Mm -hmm. So tell me more about that. Now I'm I'm intrigued, you're a guru. (laughs) Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> so it, you're right. It's not at all about technical content because to be honest, it's been a little while since <laughs> I've done that. And um, and also I could never keep up with all the different study materials that people use. So candidates usually come to me after they've failed one or more parts. Um, some have failed multiple parts multiple times, um, have been passed up for promotions, like are really getting to that point where it's make or break. And so we work on things like how to get over a failure. When we're talking about a high performing group of people, many of whom have, you know, like me, breezed through life and were very successful almost by accident, right? Without ever having to try. And then you meet your first challenge where you have to, you know, you're, you don't become automatically successful. And it's a challenge. It really is. So, I help them with bouncing back from a failure. Um, we also talk about creating a plan that really works with their life. When I was taking the exam myself, I remember people would say, well, here's how I did it. Mm-hmm. That's not necessarily what's going to work for everyone. And so we really work closely with you know, sort of looking at the demands of their life. Do they have kids and a family? Do they have outside activities that are really important to them? And how can we have the CPA exam fit in with what's already going on. And then there's, of course, some things about boundaries and accountability and sticking with it. Right. It's a long process. You know, you have to stay motivated to study even when you don't feel like it. Um, But it's been a lot of fun. It's super rewarding. And I get so excited when they call me and say, I passed. Wow. (laughs) So you you might have the statistic, you you may not, but if you could guess, what is your success rate on those who come to you uh, wanting your help, wanting your advice on how to get past the failure and how to create that plan and and how to be successful? What, What would you say that success rate would be? Well, the average pass rate is something around 49% for each part of the exam. Um, I run more like 85%. And most, I don't think I've ever had someone who's failed twice after working with me. Um, And to give you a little bit of uh, insight, I had people sit for five parts of the exam in the last quarter and they all passed. Wow. Okay, Mm -hmm. so... um... Now, I have to ask this question. Do you take clients nationally? Yeah, I work nationally. It's all over the phone. Um, I do have a few clients that I meet in, what, over Skype or Zoom because they like the personal connection. Right. If I can meet them in person uh, locally or if I'm traveling, I always try to do that. But yes, I, my clients are everywhere. Okay, audience. Those of you who ha- know people who are sitting for the exam and struggling, I, I think we may have a solution for you. <laughs> Uh, and covering a solution for you because I am so intrigued by, because every time I've always heard when, when I hear somebody talking about a, like a CPA exam coach or a CPA exam, it's, it's I think of Becker. I, I, I think of the <laughs> review, of review courses. Uh, but this is the other, this is completely the opposite and have an 85% success rate and, and getting, wow, that is, that's boom, what yeah. my head, that's cool. <laughs> It is really fun. And I used to, um, actually, when I first started doing it, I didn't like it because I was feeling the pressure. Like, I have to help these folks. 
pass. It's on me now. Right. Um, but I've really been able to refine the process and got some tricks up my sleeve that do tend to help people. And okay, so two things. So I, how long have you been doing this coaching? How many years? I've been coaching for four years now. I've been coaching for the CPA exam for the last two. Okay. So not to give out all your tricks and techniques, but if there's <laughs> one small trick that you could share with the audience on uh, being successful, what, what would that be? Oh, I'm trying to think of my favorite. Um, you know, this is the one that I really love. I, a lot of candidates come to me and, you know, whether they've started already and had some failures or if they're just getting started, which is amazing because they don't have any experience with it, but they come to me already hating the CPA exam. Yeah. Right. Uh, they're like geared up, ready for battle. Like, I gotta conquer this thing. And, they've already got this like enemy type relationship with it. And so one of the things I've worked with my clients on is developing like a love hate relationship with it. It's not going to be fun all the time, but it's almost like, hey, come on, like we're in this together. It's going to be a kind of brutal six months. And actually where this came from, I'll give you the background. A colleague of mine, her her aunt, I believe, was experiencing some really debilitating back pain. Went to all sorts of specialists, was um, really struggling and was frustrated because she had just retired. And this was supposed to be like the prime time of her life where she would get to enjoy and really experience everything. So she was heartbroken that she was basically bedridden, was just in so much pain and no one could figure out why. And she was resisting it. She was angry about it. You know, she was just trying to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. So really resisting her current situation. And one day she just decided, look, I can't let this ruin my life. I'm going to figure out a way to live with it. And actually had a conversation with it and said, you know what? It's just me and you back pain. We're going to do this life together. You're coming with me. And, you know, we're still going to enjoy the grandkids. We're going to go travel as much as we can. And we're going to do this together. And within a few weeks, it was gone. Her back pain? It went away. And it was just, I mean, some people aren't believers in that stuff, but I really am. And I think that the more we resist things, the more it persists. And she just was willing to let it go and partner with it and, you know, move through it. It was crazy. And that's the same thing with the CPA exam. We resist it, it persists. So... Just own it and love it. Wow, that's a wonderful story. Um, <laughs> I, I, man, my jaw hit the floor. Woo! <laughs> but that's uh, well, <laughs> at the at the college level, at the university level, I don't ever remember a professor saying, "Oh, it, it's okay." It, the CPA exam, you'll be be you'll be okay. Because back when I took it was before they had it. We had to take it all at one, basically over a two and a half day period. Uh, the the horror stories that would, people would talk about coming out of it, and just even the professors were they were not painting it a a, a decent picture, and, and you know, I knew my strengths and weaknesses. I got into the profession a little bit later in life, so I devised I devised a plan to figure out how to. So I was in graduate school at Case Western. I went and took all four parts without studying. Mm. And I, I wanted to see if I would one if I would pass anything. Uh, I didn't, but I also <laughs> didn't fail anything at that time. So that gave me a baseline. I said, okay, what are my two favorite parts here? So the next time I took it, I took all four, but I focused on those two, knowing that I had a good probability that I would pass the other pieces. And I, mm -hmm. I think it would, took me three times in total to do it and figure out a plan versus I hear people, you know, and I did spend a lot of time studying and, and preparing for it, but yeah, you do psych yourself out for the dead con thing. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. Just now. It's, it's just, a, it's like golf. It's just as much a game of technical skill as it is mental. You know, if we, if you go in there and you've spent all the hours that you should, you know, really did your work as far as studying and preparing, that's great. But the first second you get a question that you don't know, and if it psychs you out and you're not mentally prepared for that, that's it. Well, that's a that's a that's a great point because I I use that same analogy when I talk about public speaking. If you're so, oh. you know, 
if you've got this perfectionist uh, mentality about that first thing that you know that you messed up or got the question wrong or did something, standing in front of an audience, you begin to panic, and then yeah. it's just all downhill from there. Versus, yeah, okay, I, I messed up. Let's just keep moving forward. I'm I'm not going to let this thing get me down. And then as we're sitting here talking about it, in my mind, I'm having flashbacks of nightmares, I believe, that was happening. <laughs> but wow, that is such great great advice. And, and even more so, hire her. Don't go <laughs> don't go through the mental anguish of the exam. Take the great outlook that that Aaron has. Have her help you and 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 don't stress over it anymore. Wow. That's that's awesome. Yeah, it's cool. But then what the Kind of back to your original question is, I do work with people past the CPA exam. Um, later on in their careers when they've been successful and now they're managing people, I do um, coach and also train a lot of those folks with really developing their leadership skills to be more well-rounded as professionals. Because we all know that the first four years, five years in a uh a CPA's life is full of technical knowledge and absorption with no anything else. And then when you get to the manager level, uh, and a lot of times I think the profession has, has utilized Peter Drucker's theory of the Peter principle. We're going to promote you to your level of incompetence mm-hmm. because I'm not used to working with people. I don't know how, and I've got to do reviews. I've got, and then I, with the people aspect of it, I, I have to manage down, but now I have to manage up to the partners. Oh, and I have to manage out to the clients, and it's not so much about the work. And yeah, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of need for us in in this area. Yeah, it's really it is overwhelming. And like I said, you get a chance to work with all different leaders. I had a chance to work with one. His name is Kevin, and um, he was my supervising senior on one of my biggest engagements, and he really pushed me. He pushed me outside of my comfort zone as a young staff. Um, he had me working on challenging areas of, I was in the audit practice, so mm-hmm. challenging audit areas. And at the time I thought he was crazy. I was thinking to myself, like, does he not know I'm fresh out of school and have no idea what I'm doing? What is <laughs> he thinking? Like, this guy's crazy. Um, but he took the time to really develop me. He took time, you know, he was really busy also. But he took time to help me understand why I was doing the things I was doing, why it was important. And, you know, not only did that develop me as a professional, but it created a loyalty from me to him. If he ever needed anything, I was the first one to raise my hand. I was willing to, you know, work long hours or go the extra mile for him. And we're still friends today. So I think we tend to have this more short sighted view of things. Uh, When we're real busy to, you know, let's just get done what we have to get done. But there really needs to be a focus on developing yourself as a leader and developing the people around you. The the one thing I think of sometimes is, um, you know, when you do get promoted, it's like they know you're technically strong. If you weren't technically strong, you wouldn't have gotten promoted. Right. They would have figured out a way to move you to a different department or move you out. Um, so they've proven you've proven that already, and now it's about those soft skills. Wow, that's that, that, that's so true. So when when you're coaching at, at this level, what's the number one skill that you see is missing that you have to spend more time on in developing? Just one. <laughs> uh, well, I, what's what's the top one? The number yeah. one. The number one. Um, I think the top one is actually probably delegation. Delegation. Yeah. Um, knowing how to delegate effectively is one part of it, right? Actually having a roadmap or an how, a how to step by step guide so that you can do kind of like Kevin did, where he delegated work to me, but made it a development opportunity and had it not, had it be something that I saw value in for myself versus, oh, this guy's just piling on more work and this isn't really my job. I should just be auditing cash and have an easy day. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So that's one thing. It's the how-to, but then it's also the willingness to do it. There's all sorts of fears and underlying things that get in people's way. 
uh, that stop them from delegating altogether. What are some of those fears that you that you see? Uh, well, one is a lot of like we talked about how this is such a high performing group of individuals, mm-hmm. right? We've been praised, many of us, this may not speak to all of us, but many of us have been praised throughout our life for being the one that gets results. Like I am the one, you can count on me to produce high quality work and I'm going to get it done for you. Now, if I'm getting my value from you appreciating that part of me, I'm not going to give my tasks to somebody else because I get praised for that. Mm. So they almost see it as some people will share, well, if I delegate these tasks, they'll see me as replaceable or my value inherently goes down because I've given that to someone else. Now they can get praise for doing that work. So that's one side of it. And then the other is not wanting to be pushy, not wanting to be that guy that is dumping more work on other people. You know, it's my responsibility. Or I would say the la- the only other one is um, just wanting to control it. I'm better at it, faster at it, smarter than you. <laughs> and it's easier for me to do it myself rather than take the time. That's the one I probably hear more often than not is... I can get it done quicker. It's just easier. I'll just get it done. But then I also ask them, so how many hours a day are you working? And because you haven't delegated. And they're going, yeah. but what if I do, it's going to take me twice as long to teach Aaron how to do this. I went, right, it is. But, you know, a month from now, you can let the reins off and, and, and Aaron will be fine. And you've just carved out extra de- extra hours in your day. There is that, mm-hmm. you know, that that, upfront cost, that sunk cost initial that you have to incur in order to release some things. And I hear the, I hear all, the, the, all but the one that you, you let off with, that kind of surprised me uh, mm-hmm. a, a lot that that is some of the, uh, of the thought process of I've been praised, uh, you know, the high performer, I, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a person that gets it done. But once you once you've moved into a management role, that whole job description has now changed from when you've been a senior or, or a staff person, and mm-hmm. your job is to develop people. And, and I think teaching is a hard thing to do. Yeah. Um, and because as, as we're sitting there thinking about it, we, we we speak in a different language. We speak in a foreign language called accounting. Yeah. And, and it's taken us a long time to master that. So as they've been learning this new language of accounting, to delegate, to teach, does it's not all accounting language. You've got to use some different approaches, some plain English aspect to get people to understand. And when I can't get you to understand, I get even more frustrated. And then it just goes, you know, haywire versus... Yeah, let me let me see how I can translate this to you in a simpler manner, or or, or put some type of uh, analogy around it, or metaphor to help you understand. Mm-hmm. Um, a, a lot of people really struggle with that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think one of the challenges when I was first in a leadership role with you know brand new staff working for me was if I explained it the one way that I understood it. And then they didn't get it. They have a different learning style or just a different communication style than I did. It really threw in my face like, oh, maybe I don't know it as well as I (laughs) thought I did. It kind of highlights some of those insecurities. Mm -hmm. And again, I think that's really all it takes for some people to get thrown off and not want to confront that again. Like, okay, well, never mind. I'll just, I'll do it. I I read read across a recent quote by, I think it was, Einstein said, if you can't describe something simply, then you don't know it well enough. I just, I'm sorry, Albert. I know I just kind of butchered that, but it was along that sense there. Mm -hmm. Some people say like, you should be able to describe your business or describe what you do so that a seven-year-old can understand it. Right. Um, And it is, it's, it is a challenge. And I think that's where, you know, accounting firms could, well... I don't want to call anybody out, but I feel like it is a profession. <laughs> we could do a better job of developing those types of skills and really placing some more emphasis on how necessary that is. We tend to focus on being really technically sound, which of course is important because that's the job. But 
being able to teach and develop others is not a skill that comes naturally. We're not, we don't just know how to do that because we got promoted to senior or promoted to manager. You know, it doesn't come in the the little package they give you. You have to develop those skills. And sometimes it feels a little too little too late. If they do it at the manager level, these folks have been leading others for a long time and maybe not doing a great job of it. <laughs> exactly. And yeah, it should be it should be sprinkled in at some degree that 15% or 20% during those those f- first five years. Uh, mm-hmm. But I, I find that, I think an, another challenge that managers, senior, that, w- that we have with this complex language that, we, that we've that we learned over a period of time is, is, like I said, translating it in a way that somebody else who doesn't have the same learning style that we do, and even within the profession, but we, we tend to be, attached too much to data and mm-hmm. we don't turn data into stories. People remember stories. Yeah. We don't remember data. And I, I think that's one of the, the biggest opportunities we have as a profession is to take very complex information and build a story around it so people can understand. And I've heard people say, I, you know, I, I, mine is so complex. I, I, there's no way I could turn that into a story. And my response is, go watch a TED Talk. Mm-hmm. Technology, education, design, it's all technical in nature. And they take very technical topics and craft it in a way into a story, then talk about the statistics and the story that really resonates with people. So it can be done. It just, it's not billable. It's not chargeable. <laughs> and that might be, actually, I, I just thought about that. That might be the challenge because it's something that's not, it takes extra work to do. Mm-hmm. I love that though. I was thinking that it you do need to be able to understand the application of it. You know, I think the other challenge is that when we do get busy in accounting, I mean, we get busy, we get real busy, busy. <laughs> you know, and um, it, there's not a lot of time for that. So it resorts to like, well, I'll just follow the work paper from last year. I'll, I'll just do what they've done. I'll kind of figure it out. But we don't take that extra time to get the really deep understanding that would be required to create a story out of it or to explain it in multiple ways. But I love that. I think that's, uh, that would be more fun if it was <laughs> stories that people could remember. Yeah, I, I think it is too. And, and what you just described was, um, what was what was her name? We all dated her, Sally. Yeah, <laughs> Sally. S- same as last year. Yeah. Um, yeah. We ha- we have to find a way to dump Sally uh, and, and find a new creative approach. And I just you know the shameless plug. That's a, that's a class that I, uh, I developed, but it came about because the managing partner who I knew, I asked him a question. I said, "What keeps you up at night?" And he goes, "Sally." And I said, "Your wife's <laughs> your wife's name's Mary." Any, <laughs> anything you. Are you confessing something to me? Because no, you know what I mean, Sally. Same as last year, our firm has been in business for a, a number of years. He was a young managing partner, and he's a, he's. We've been doing the same thing we did prior year, prior year, prior. I'm afraid that Sally's going to rear her ugly head one day and going to take this firm down. And he said, "How can you help me?" So I, I came up with that that creativity course for him. But yeah, we. We get so busy that and we're also under these chargeable constraints, whatever, that I think don't allow us to take a moment to and really think through the issue mm-hmm. because we got to make budget. Right. Yeah, it's kind of the, it's, you're stuck in a, between a rock and a hard place, right? It's something we should do. And it, sometimes the constraints don't allow for it, but I think it's really worthwhile to take some time out and, and look at that because I think, like you were saying, that partner is onto something. The lo- you know, we get. I I'm guilty of it in my personal life too, right? You get sort of stuck in your ways. You get <laughs> complacent. Things get comfortable, and then before you know it, the industry has changed. It's moved on, and there you are, still doing it the same as last year, which is really the same as 20 years ago. And you're like, whoa, what happened? Exactly, and and you're a lot younger than I am, so you can imagine how I you know, and I see some of my baby boomer brother and getting really still not. This is the way we've done it. This is when I hear someone say, "This is the way we've always done it." My first thought is, now we need to change it. Yes. 
because it's outdated. And and some people go, oh, no, it's not. I went, oh, okay. May I ask you this question? Do you have a BlackBerry on you that I can use? <laughs> <laughs> or like the old car phones that you have to plug into the cigarette. <laughs> Oh yeah, they were about the size. Yeah, <laughs> they were about the size of a couch at one point in time. <laughs> Go back and watch the movie Wall Street with uh, Charlie Sheen and and um, his dad. You look at these phones and, and Gordon Gecko and, and Michael Douglas, and these things were huge. And now we've got everything on a, on a phone. So yeah, we, we have to not be complacent and relying on Sally. And and I, so I'm just gonna. Is it time, and this is probably stuck in my mind because uh, this one of the episodes coming up in the next couple of weeks is, weeks is by, uh, I interviewed Jody Paydar, who is the radical CPA. And if you haven't, uh, if you don't know Jody, listen to the interview because she's trying to flip the profession to get out of that rut, to start looking at things in, in, in a different way. And maybe it's time that we have to dump this utilization, realization, billing model and go to a flat fee type of thing to allow us to have that time to reflect, have that, ask that extra question and don't feel like we're under this budgetary time constraint. Because when I even ask those in firms, does utilization and realization really work? And I get the same answer. Uh, probably not, but this is <laughs> the way we've always done it. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's true. And I think the profession really is moving. I will check out her interview. That sounds really <laughs> interesting. But it sounds like it is moving to being more people focused, more client focused, client service in a new, more dynamic way. And things are going to have to change. We got to keep up with Keep up with the times. Keep, yeah, we need to keep up with the times. As I say, <laughs> you know, for many, for a long time, CPA, the P in CPA stood for procrastination. When it really <laughs> now needs to stand for progressive, be in front of it versus behind it. Quit being storytellers, have we been? Because you know, we're always working on yesterday. Uh, a lot would now if yesterday is going to be done by maybe a machine or, or some type of program, then I need to be able to look forward and and be more do more predicting versus mm -hmm. procrastinating. Yeah. Yeah. Strategy. But that doesn't really work with the CPA. I like your, your word. <laughs> exactly. I, but I, to your point, I think I, I'm seeing more and more firms uh, start to really embrace this and start looking at it and, and, and recognize it that, that they need to change. They need to do something, something's, something's different. So how do we, and, and, as you have grown your business with with your leadership and coaching, that those people skills, uh, same way with myself. Because during the recession, I was just teaching all hardcore accounting. That consists yeah. of maybe point one one three of my <laughs> business today, uh, because there is that need that that continues to grow. So that's that's a good sign. And there'll always be those who won't believe in it and will get stuck in the ways and and. For those who I've talked to, those are the ones who probably won't be around much longer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we have to embrace it. You know, just like I'm telling candidates to embrace the CPA exam, <laughs> I I see a lot of firms that are resistant. You know, whether they're one and two individuals up to multi office, you know, larger firms, we are we're all resistant to change, right? It's uncomfortable. We're moving into the unknown, so there is. There is that level of unease, I guess, with not, with not knowing. But I think we do have to kind of lean into it and embrace the opportunity that's there versus seeing it as something wrong or, you know, seeing it as a negative. Right. I love how you said lean into it. Don't, and I'm thinking, yeah, because we tend to be like a little bit like this when, but versus leaning into it, taking the challenge on. And, you know, failure is an option. Because when we fail, we learn. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and some crazy ideas and crazy failures have led to, you know, bigger and better things down the down the road. I think that's that's one of the other challenges that we struggle with is accepting failure because a lot, and I, I believe this has changed, but back when I was the, in a firm, there was a lot, there was a lot of finger pointing when you screwed up. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the fingers were pointed at, that person, that guy, that girl. I'd say I did that pretty well because I, I was on the receiving end of that finger a lot. And um, 
but I- I- anymore, those those mistakes, you know, they're just it's like giving somebody some rope. They can either build a bridge or hang themselves. Yeah. And, and I've hung myself a lot. I've got some really good ro- uh, rope burns on my neck, but I learned a lot from that. And I don't ever let that happen again. Mm-hmm. Well, and to your point, you know, it's one type of culture that would point the finger of failure at somebody else. You know, that's one dynamic in an organization. And I think that it's a place that companies should look if they're taking on these major shifts, right? Their business will look different five years from now than it does today, but that's going to take something. And I think that, you know, they're going to have to be in it together. And it may highlight some of the issues they have with their culture. They may also want to take some proactive steps to really build their team, you know, team connection and build that culture up so that they can go through this change more smoothly. Exactly. Um, I, I I will share this with you that uh, one of my attendees in, in a class just recently, we were talking about change. We were talking about um, this uh, at, at at a point of where we're we're, we're competent, we're, we're comfortable. Convention that was the word. We're at a, a conventional things are the same, and then. We've got unconventional, the, the whacked out, the the the, the crazy idea uh, that we're afraid to say, but we need to say it to get it out there. And as he said, you got you, you, in between. In between this is where the opportunity is. Mm-hmm. And I, I, my face just fell off when he said that. I went, "Oh my God!" The opportunity is somewhere between conventional and unconventional, but we have to we have to allow ourselves to be unconventional and say crazy things because somewhere in between that, that's where we're going to change, and that's going to be the sweet spot. Yeah, and I think it's creating the culture that makes it safe for people to throw their ideas out there. You know, if it's a judgy culture, somebody might be sitting there with a brilliant idea that's going to save that business. Mm-hmm. And really take you to the next level, and they're gonna maybe die with that idea, you know, because they won't tell anybody. So uh, really making it safe. Well, well said. Uh, I was doing that this creativity course for a, a, a company in Maryland, and they brought their emerging leaders from the U.S. and Latin America, and and one of the things was, well, how can we increase profitability within the company? And, and let's just brainstorm. And, and I had set the stage, say anything. I. Bad ideas are just bridges to good ideas. No ideas are nothing, lead to nothing. That's 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 <laughs> uh, comes from improv. And after a while, this one guy from Latin America, he goes, "I tell you what, we're going to do, my friend. This is how we're going to increase, you know, the, our profitability within our company. We are going to kill all of our competition salespeople. That's what we're going to do." <laughs> and the whole place erup- erupted in laughter, and, and then we all got a little bit nervous. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, and I went, okay, guys, if, if I'm going to walk the talk here and say bad ideas are bridges to good ideas, first first things first, we're going to take murder off the table. <laughs> but let's let's think of it. Let's instead let's let's identify the our competition's top salespeople and let's go poach them. Let's go give them a forty thousand dollar increase with the signing bonus. We might catch one or two without having to kill anybody. Would we have gotten to that point if that guy didn't have? The courage to say mm-hmm. something completely whack that I hope he was being completely wacky. <laughs> I hope he really wasn't serious about that. But I'm not sure if we would have got there with, without that crazy idea. Yeah. And it's being willing to try things out and maybe fall on your face. But if you don't try it, you're, you know, you're going to get left behind. So it, it does take courage to share the ideas and it takes courage as an organization to be willing to kind of take a flyer on some of these ideas. Exactly. Yeah, it, it does. It, takes, it does take a lot of courage. Uh, Aaron, we could be here for... 